But uh, what I want to do today is talk about a little bit about dinosaurs, and I want to use that to lead into the evolution of birds, and then we're going to come back and talk about uh, mammals. And I want to talk about two more uh, bigger topics. Uh, one is thermal regulation, and the other one is um, water, uh, water relations. Uh, those are two major topics that sort of epitomize the transition that we're making from an aquatic lifestyle to a fully terrestrial one. So the whole focus of this course is really the transition from being an aquatic form to being a terrestrial form, and all the things that have to go on in order to successfully make that transition. So in terms of the labs then, uh, we still have the locomotion stuff. Um, I used to have a lot of uh, herps in the, you know, of my own, um, and I've gotten rid of all of those things, so I used to have all these different kinds of snakes and whatnot. Um, does anybody here have a pet snake? Nobody has pet snakes anymore. Okay. Yeah. I want a pet snake. Pardon? I want a pet snake. Yeah, no, well, I can give you advice on what to get and what not to get. I had one, but he died. Oh, that little guy. Um, all right, so uh, I'm sort of feeling out what I want to do in terms of laboratory exercises, and uh, we may talk about that a little bit on, on Thursday. Uh, but what I want to do today, then, is talk uh, about some key points about um, the dinosaurs, and then see how that leads us into a discussion of the evolution of birds. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to point out is that dinosaurs basically um, have made this sort of interesting transition within the clay. Um, there are some forms, and this is not a dinosaur, that have this sort of tip of the, both of these are diapsid reptiles. Um, they're archosaurs. Um, and you'll notice that the one up above uh, has all four appendages being roughly equal size. And that changes pretty dramatically here in this later incarnation in which there's clear hind limb dominance. And that's an interesting feature that shows up again and again uh, in the dinosaurs, is this extreme version of hind limb dominance. Um, and usually the assumption is that one of the consequences of hind limb dominance is that these animals are then bipedal. Um, why they should be bipedal isn't exactly clear, but it's resulted in all sorts of stories and and hypotheses about uh, the evolution of birds. Um, so you can see that here, this image of Thionoticus, uh, which is one of these species that has sort of uh, promoted this idea about the evolution of birds. Uh, so it's clearly a bipedal. Um, and this is a species that was described by Ostrom. Ostrom was the vertebrate paleontologist at Yale who ultimately occupy the seat that was initially held by um, Othniel Charles Marsh. Um, and the key here is this uh, claw on the back foot. And what Ostrom argued was that Dionychus was using that as sort of a predatory device uh, so that this animal would run and be sort of an active predator and jump on to the side of some apatosaurus or something like that and just rip open the side of the animal uh, with this large claw and then kill the animal in that way. And that brings up a couple of points. First is, it's essentially implicitly making the assumption that dinosaurs were highly active, that they had high metabolic rates. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. It's not very parsimonious to argue that they did. It is probable that they had high body temperatures, but that was not a consequence of high metabolic rates. More likely, it's a consequence of thermal inertia. So we don't know what the hearts look like in these guys, whether they had four-chambered hearts like other endotherms, or whether they had the typical sort of uh, reptilian model, which is a three, three-and-a-half-chambered heart. But at any rate, um, this is one of those examples of adaptationist storytelling where you see something like this and you're using it. Ah, oh, you know, why would this animal have this big claw? Oh, clearly running, jumping, all the sorts of things that warm-blooded animals do. 
and then using that claw to rip open its prey, right, and then kill it in that way, promoting this active lifestyle, and that argument is central to the notion that the birds evolved from the dinosaurs. Okay, more about that in a little bit. Now, uh, they are all diapsids, and there's this interesting thing that happens in dinosaurs. Uh, so they're diapsid, they have two temporal openings, an upper one here and a lower one. The other interesting thing that dinosaurs do is they have this thing right here, this antorbital finasteride. So it's an opening right here on the side of the rostrum. You don't see that in other diapsids, but you do see it in the dinosaurs. The other thing I want to point out is this fossa right here, this opening. You do see that in other archosaurs like the crocodilians. They do have that opening. What's the purpose of that in dinosaurs? Well, as in crocodilians, remember, there is this sound conduction route that's going right across the quadrate and the articular bones, right there. And the otic portion of the brain is at the back. And in mammals, the quadrate and the articular bones are used as sound conduction devices. Okay? They become the malleus and the incus. So it's probable, possible, perhaps, that this is used to sort of like the head of a snare drum, it vibrates. And that vibrational energy is then transmitted through the quadrate and the articular bone to the back of the skull. All right. Well, uh, just uh, one quick point, just to sort of um, familiarize yourself with the phylogeny that we're talking about. Um, the squamate reptiles, those are the snakes and the lizards. Those are these guys down here. So those are the lepidosaurs, right? So the lepidosaurs are the snakes and lizards. There's this weird, weird, weird reptile called Sphenodon. Sphenodon occurs only on islands off the northern coast of New Zealand. There's one species, perhaps two. They used to occupy the entirety of New Zealand, but now they're restricted to just these islands primarily as a consequence of sheep. So why are they on these islands? Because the sheep are not on the islands. The weird thing about Sphenodon, it's a rhinocephalian. It looks like a lizard, but it's not. And it's weird because it doesn't have any upper teeth. Instead, it has a keratinaceous beak like a bird or a turtle. The other weird thing is, these animals get to be relatively large. And the thing about lizards is, big lizards eat plants, small lizards eat bugs. Why? Because bugs run fast. Plants don't run away. If you're big and you have to run down an insect, it's not likely that you're going to get it. The cost of getting the food item is higher than the nutrition you get as a result of capturing it. It works for a small animal, not for a big animal. So what big animals do, big lizards, iguanas, right, sphenodon, they instead eat plants. The bad thing about plants, not a lot of nutrition in plant material. The other problem is, these islands off the coast of New Zealand are cold. Most animals, green iguanas that eat plants, live in hot climates where they can bask and keep their body temperature up. Sphenodon does not. It lives in a cold place. But what does Sphenodon do? It turns out that Sphenodon does not eat plants. On these islands where it persists, if you've ever been on an island in the Atlantic, off the coast of Ireland or Scotland or something like that, the one thing you notice are the breeding birds. All these marine birds are there on those cliffs with their nests and their hatchlings and all of that. And that's what's on these islands in New Zealand. And what Sphenodon does is it eats baby birds. So baby birds, a lot of fat, a lot of protein, easy to digest, 
even when their body temperatures are low. And that's how they make it. At any rate, those are the lepidosaurs there. Okay. Then, look what happens over here. Here are the crocodilians. So these are all the archosaurs right here, the crocodilians, the pterosaurs, and then the dinosaurs, the two different kinds of dinosaurs, the ornithisians and the saurischians. And one hypothesis has the 80s coming off from the saurischian dinosaurs. And that's kind of interesting, and I want to talk about that in just a moment. But notice the AVs are derived from the dinosaurs. That's where the controversy exists. There are some people that say, yeah. Other people say, well, clearly the birds are archosaurs, but they don't come off here. They come off way back here from the crocodilians. That's where the controversy lies. In other words, there's no question that birds are archosaurian reptiles. The question is, where do they branch off? All right. Now, the cool thing about dinosaurs is their hips. I know you think, oh, it's because they're so big and all of that sort of stuff. Don't care. The really interesting thing about these guys is their hips. And we can divide the dinosaurs up into two groups. The ornithischian dinosaurs and the saurischian dinosaurs. Basically, the bird-hipped dinosaurs and the reptile hip dinosaurs. So, the bird hip dinosaurs are these guys. The reptile hip dinosaurs are these guys. So these are the saurischians, these are the ornithischians. But the birds don't come from the bird hip dinosaurs. The birds evolve from the reptile hip dinosaurs. All right? So that's the first thing that's kind of weird. Now, Let's think about what it means to have this hip morphology versus this hip morphology. In this hip morphology, what you can do, if you want to bring your leg forward or back, you just use these retractor muscles and these protractor muscles. So here, these protractor muscles can be attached to the pubic bone. Remember, there are three bones in the hip, the pubis, the ischium, and the ilium. Right now, you are all sitting on your ischium. When you put your hands on your hips, you're putting your hands on your ilium. And then the pubis is that bone right in the front. So there's the pubis. The protractor muscles can go from here to there to pull the femur forward. So you can have active movement bringing the leg forward. Driving the leg back, those muscles can either go to the ischium or they can go to the ilium. So you can bring the muscle. Where do your muscles go to bring your leg back? They go to the ischium. So they go right to there. Well, look what happens. In the bird hip dinosaurs, the pubic bone is rotated backwards, which means now that the muscles that used to be attached to the pubic bone to bring the leg forward can't do that anymore. So you've lost the ability now to actively bring that leg forward. What do you do? Well, there are a couple of strategies. Right? Well, first of all, why do it? And then secondly, how do you do it? Well, how do you bring your leg forward? I guess if your leg is back like this and you just sort of tilt up, gravity will let it swing forward. But obviously, that's a slow and laborious kind of thing. You're not going to have an active lifestyle doing that. Of course, muscle doesn't fossilize. So we don't know if those protractor muscles perhaps went to the ilium instead. Seems unlikely. Why? Think about the evolution of muscles and nerves and blood vessels. If you if suddenly you change the morphology of your bones, something during development has to work so that the muscle now has the insertion and the origin in the correct places. Because it's, an all, it's all an integrated unit. The muscles and the bones and the nerves and the blood vessels are all integrated. 
You can't make a change to one without also making a change to all the others. So now if you move this pubic bone backwards, you can't just miraculously have the protractor muscles going up to the ilium. Unless there's something weird going on in development that we don't understand. That would be a cool dissertation topic, looking at development of those bones during and muscles during embryology of reptiles. There's an interesting thing that the ornithicians do, though, and that is that in the fossil record, after you see this, you see this. And here what's happened is the pubic bone now, which is folded back like this, develops this extension which comes forward. So now, presumably, because that didn't work, there was strong selection on the pressure on these animals to have this extension so that now the muscles can attach here to that extension of the pubic bone, and now you can actively bring that leg forward. Why did they do that? What possible selective pressure could have forced that pubic bone to fold back like that? What's going on? Well, who are these guys? Those are the, uh, the theropods and the sauropods. Yeah, these, are, these, these are the theropod reptiles, which happen to be right, the bipedal guys. These are the guys like T. rex. So these are the guys with an act, presumably an active, predaceous sort of livestock. Was T. rex actively predaceous? Let's think about that. How much did T. rex weigh? Uh, somewhere between like nine and seven tons. Somewhere in the neighborhood of ten tons, perhaps. How much does an elephant weigh? Five to six, maybe seven. Well, an Indian elephant will weigh five tons or so. African elephant can weigh up to 14,000 pounds, so seven tons. So T. rex is elephant sized in terms of body mass. Okay? Do elephants run? No. All right, do you think T. rex ran? Probably not. No. There was this interesting paper in Science Magazine a number of years ago by a couple of physicists. In the midst of all this debate about T. rex and how predacious and mean and awesome T. rex was, jumping and running down other dinosaurs and ripping them to shreds and stuff like that, these two physicists asked a very simple question. All right? T. rex is bipedal. What happens if T. rex stumbles and falls? All of you are bipedal. All of you at some point have stumbled and fallen flat on your face, flat on your ass, whatever. What happens to T. rex when it stumbles and falls? Think back to when you were a little kid, three years old, you stumbled and fell, bounced a few times, got up, cried like a baby, but everything was fine. Now, imagine your current size, you stumble and fall, you've got bruised hands, bruised knees, a bruised hip, you feel it. Why? Well, because you're about 100 plus pounds heavier. Now think, imagine that you weigh five tons and you stumble and fall. So what these two physicists did was very simple. It's all right, force equals mass times acceleration. The animal has this much mass. It's falling from this height. How much energy does it have when it hits the ground? Is that energy enough to break bones, crush the body? The answer was yeah. So did T-Rex run? No. If it ever stumbled and fell, it would be dead. Okay, very simple argument, very simple, clear explanation for why. You don't even have to think about sheer forces on the limbs or anything of that sort. So those are the T-Rex guys, okay. These guys right here are the big sauropod dinosaurs. The guys that are lumbering around like this with the long necks and the long tails, eating plant material and whatnot. 
What's the problem with eating plants? Primarily cellulose. It's hard to digest cellulose. What did dinosaurs do to help them process that cellulose? What do mammals do to help them process the cellulose? What kind of teeth do horses and deer have? They have teeth that are designed to crush the cellulose. Did dinosaurs have teeth designed to crush cellulose? No. They had peg-like teeth like you see on an alligator. All right. So you're going to eat that plant material and swallow it essentially whole. Now what? You could eat a pencil, and take the graphite out, eat the pencil, how much of that pencil are you going to digest? Go eat, a, go eat corn on the cob. You eat corn on the cob, you get all the starch from the inside, the next day, take a dump, what do you see in the toilet? The corn kernels. Why? Because you couldn't digest them. Why can't you digest them? You chew them up enough, why don't they digest? What's the difference between cellulose and starch? They're both carbohydrates. What's the difference? It's like uh, cellulose is like beta, but connected to each other. Starch is like kappa. Uh, that, that's right. It's the configuration of the monomers which are different. That's all. We have enzymes that allow us to digest the starches but not enzymes that allow us to digest the cellulose. The result of that is you can't digest cellulose. Same is true for a reptile. What, what do cows do? They eat cellulose, but what do cows do that's different from us? A cow has a gut full of bacteria. The bacteria do have the enzymes to digest the cellulose. So what the cow does is it allows the bacteria to di digest the cellulose, and then the cow consumes the product of the, the bacterial decomposition. So what did these dinosaurs do? They swallowed rocks. They had stomachs full of rocks, and while that cellulose is in their stomachs, the rocks are banging together, crushing up the cellulose. So they can at least get some of it, and their high body temperatures probably enabled them to ferment it and that's how they got their nutrition. Now, think about cows. Are cows big? Yeah. Bison, bigger still. Think about these guys. Why does that pubic bone go folding back? How many people have ever worked with cows? So what is Slim trim guys or yeah, they're, they're, they have pretty big guts, right? Why do they have such big guts? They've got this four-chambered stomach, and they've got miles of intestines. Okay? Why? More surface area. Yes. Gut retention time is long. Food goes into the front end of that animal and doesn't come out for days. If you have a koala bear, gut retention time on a koala bear is two weeks. Food goes in the mouth, that same particle of food comes out the anus two weeks later. Okay? Now, explain to me why is that pubic bone folded back? To make more room for the intestines. To make more room for the intestines. By folding that back, you can have a bigger gut, which means you can now have longer gut retention times, which means you can spend more time extracting nutrients out of that food item. So now let's make the jump and talk a little bit about the evolution of birds. It's pretty most people would argue that birds evolved from dinosaurs. That seems to be the consensus. There are some people that are still resistant. Shankar Chatterjee from Arizona is resistant. Alan Fiducia is resistant still, right? 
but most people would argue that birds come from dinosaurs. Right away, we know that birds don't have bird hips, as in the reptiles, if they evolved from the dinosaurs, it was from the Saurician hip design. Okay? Now, having said that, there are two ways to take to the air. There's the ground up hypothesis, and there's the top down hypothesis. So you can either, if you're going to take to the air, you can run along the ground, flap your wings like crazy, and then take to the air. Or you can climb a tree, sit on a branch, and jump off the branch, and then glide down and flap your wings as you glide, and maybe extend the distance that you're traveling a little bit. The problem for dinosaur people is that dinosaurs did not get up into trees. They have the wrong hip design. There's no evidence anywhere that dinosaurs ever got into trees. And for that reason, all the dinosaur people make the argument that the evolution of flight was from the ground up. Here's the problem with that argument. If you look at any vertebrate and how that vertebrate runs, you're running on two legs. Well, let's think of some lizards that run on two legs. Jesus Christ lizards run on two legs. You guys know what Jesus lizards are, right? They're the guys that run across the surface of the water. How do they do it? So the back legs are going like crazy, and what are the front legs doing? Just hanging there? Is that how you run? You go run a sprint, and you just move your legs, and your hands are just, arms are just dangling that by your sides? What do you do with your arms? You're doing this. Okay? Are your arms moving synchronously with your back legs or asynchronously? They're totally opposite. Okay? Great. Now imagine you want to flap your wings and fly. How's that going to work? You're running like hell with your legs, and now your wings are going, one wing's flapping like that. How's that going to work, man? It's not. In order to get lift, in order to fly, the wings are going to have to be synchronous. Is there any animal that runs with synchronous movement of the front appendages? No. Okay? In other words, to make that transition from running to flapping your wings synchronously is going to require changes either in the wiring of the brain, right? or neuromuscular control of the flight muscles. That's going to be essential. Let's imagine we've solved that problem. Now, here we've got this nice little guy. It has some kind of feathers. And this animal is now going to jump and flap and catch the insect. Must have been a small animal, not a big animal. Why? Why? Would it have had to have been a small animal rather than a big one? It would be much harder to get off the ground. Let's think about all the all the animals that you know that are capable of flight. Ostriches. Can ostriches fly? Emus? How about turkeys? Yeah, for how far? Not very far. A couple of feet, a couple of yards. To roost, that's the other. Yeah. They don't, they don't do it very well, okay? And a turkey is not a, I mean, it's a big bird, but it's not a giant bird, okay? The reason for all of that is the cost of transport, how much it costs you to move and to run. And we'll talk about those equations a little later on. But it's pretty easy to model, and it's pretty clear right from the start that the evolution of flight must have been from a relatively small animal. Well, small reptiles go after insects. Big ones go after plants. No reason to fly if you're eating plants. So here you are, you're running, you're chasing after this dragonfly. You're running like hell, and now you want to catch it. So you jump and flap your wings like crazy to catch it. And what happens as soon as your toes leave the ground? Okay, let's think about jumping. 
let's imagine we could film using high-speed video students jumping. What would happen? You jump, what determines how high you jump? Is it the arch of your foot? No. Even more basic than that. Force put into the jump. Force equals mass times acceleration. Okay? How heavy you are. How heavy you are is going to increase your mass, right? If you want to jump high, you're going to need a lot of force, which means you're going to need a, not a whole lot of mass, and you're going to need a lot of acceleration. When do you have peak acceleration? Okay, let's change the question a little bit. Watch a basketball player. How high can a basketball player jump? Can a tall basketball player jump higher than you? Why? He can. Why can't he? Why do basketball players, why does somebody like Michael Jordan or LeBron James or Shaquille O'Neal, why can those guys jump so incredibly high and you can't? What size shoes does uh, Michael Jordan wear? 15, 16? I think it's 17. Okay. So what does that tell you? A lot of surface area. Forget the surface area in this case. Got long legs. He's got long legs. So you crouch down and you're going to jump. What determines how fast you're going when you lose contact with the ground? The distance through which you have accelerated. The greater the distance through which you accelerate, the higher the velocity when you leave the ground. And it's your velocity when you leave the ground that's going to determine how high you go. During World War II, the Germans were developing the V-2 rocket. Okay? They wanted to be able to fire these rockets and hit London. So they had these physicists that knew exactly the ballistics equation. And the ballistics equation, how far that missile goes, is a function of the angle at which it launches and its velocity when it takes off. Those two things. The greatest distance is going to be at 45 degrees. So what they had to do to reach London, they had to have the correct velocity when that thing left the ground. And that, for, for a rocket, is how much propellant do you have. Okay. What's going to determine your velocity when you leave the ground? The distance through which you accelerate. If you have long legs and you jump, you're accelerating through a much greater distance. So when you leave the ground, you have a much higher velocity. After you've left the ground, everything is already determined. But it's your velocity when you leave the ground that's important. A small person like us, you jump, you've jumped through a shorter distance, your velocity is much lower, and there's no way you can achieve the height that that taller person did just because they jumped through, or they were moving their legs through a greater distance, they had a higher velocity when they left the ground. So here's this guy. He jumps, and as soon as he jumps, what happens to his velocity? He's been accelerating up to the point where he leaves the ground. As soon as he loses contact with the ground, he's decelerating. He's slowing down. He jumps. He's slowing down. The insect keeps moving at the same velocity. And the insect gets away. You see the problem? Why fly? It's obviously not for feeding. So there are two problems you have to solve. The first is, 
synchrony of the appendages. Actually, there are a bunch of problems. One problem, synchrony of the appendages. Two, why the hell are you doing it? If it's to catch that bug, you're not going to get it. Three is, half a bird can't fly. In other words, before you can fly, those wings must be fully developed. What's the advantage of having half a wing? If natural selection is selecting wings on these animals with feathers, what possible advantage is there to having this short little stubby wing? Or a wing that doesn't have flight feathers? What's the advantage? Nobody yet to this point has been able to explain that selection, that selective pathway. It doesn't work. It's one of those mysteries that we don't understand. Talk about the evolution of bats or flying squirrels, it's easy because they climb. If you're launching from a tree, that's easy. You just have to jump. And at first, your wings don't have to be well formed at all. All you have to be able to do is control your control where you're going, break your fall so that you don't hit the ground with too much force. You can use them like parachutes. This version is easy, this version is hard. And yet the dinosaur people cling to that, and the reason they do is because dinosaurs didn't get into trees. Now you look at you look at reptiles, okay? Um, let's see, this I think is Archaeopteryx. Uh, uh, let's see, B is a modern bird. What's C? C is, no, C is a modern bird. Um, Archaeopteryx, there's Archaeopteryx right there. So there's, our, look at that lizard hips, okay? There's Archaeopteryx, there's a modern bird. What do you notice about the difference between a modern bird and Archaeopteryx? Like the beak. Yeah, I mean, birds have beaks. Archaeopteryx have teeth. No, no modern bird has teeth. No bird fossils ever had teeth, with the possible exception of Protoavis. Okay, what else do you notice? Is the pubis shorter? Yeah, um, but when you when you make a turkey for Thanksgiving. You've got the whole family sitting around the table and that tur everybody's gorged on that turkey and the carcass is sitting there in the middle of the... It's all this integral unit, isn't it? It doesn't fall apart. That carcass is solid. The flight tension on a bird is solid. All those vertebrae are fused. The sensacrum, that's all fused. That stuff, it's all fused. The ribs are all fused. It's a solid block of bone. There's no movement in that structure. It's not like you. you. Birds can't do any of that sort of stuff. The only thing that a bird can move is its neck, its wings, and its legs. Everything else is solid. Why? Let's imagine, let's imagine birds could move all this stuff. Flying through the air, Got a tune going through their head, rocking out to bitch on the run by Samantha Fish or something, just you know, doing one of those things. What happens? The aerodynamics change. Like that. Okay? The fact that the bird can fly is partially a function of the fact that the flight engine is rock solid. It's not moving around. The aerodynamics of the flight engine aren't changing. Notice the keel on the sternum. That sternum has this blade of bone sticking out like that. Why? You don't see that on this guy, an Archaeopteryx. You don't see that here on this guy. What is that blade of bone that 
on the sternum, what's that all about? What's that for? Give you a nice convenient place to cut when you're carving the turkey. God likes people, so he said, yeah, I'm going to make it easy for him when I'm carving the turkey. I'm going to put that little blade in there. Help him divvy up the bird for everybody in the family. Why is that there? What hooks up to that blade? Bullshit. You guys, you guys don't know that? What's that? The pectoral muscles. The same muscles you've got right there. Right? Only this bird has... Imagine you had pecs that stuck out like this. Think of the bench press you could do. It would be amazing. Okay? These big, giant, damn bones sticking out like that, so you have these huge pectoralis muscles that are able to bring the wings down like that. So in other words, the bird has this enormous power stroke going down. I guess Archaeopterids did. Okay? Now, how's about getting the wings back up? What muscles do you use to bring your arms back like this? Like the trapezoid muscles? Yeah, tra trapezius muscles and latissimus dorsi and whatnot. Okay? Look at the bird. How big and beefy is the back on a bird? You carve that turkey. Hey, anybody want the back? There's nothing there. So how does the bird get its wings up like that? Because the bird has a power downstroke, and it also has a power upstroke. Bats don't. Bats have a power downstroke, and then they do this. Power. 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 A bird does power, 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 power. How do they get the muscles to power up? How do they get the wings to move up? They cheat. You have, what are the muscles right here on your chest? Pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, pectoantebrachialis. Okay? On a cat, it's pectoantebrachialis. You have pectoralis major, pectoralis minor. What the bird does is it takes the pectoral, one of those pectoralis muscles, and I've forgotten which, is used to bring the muscle down like this. Both muscles on you attach here to the sternum and attach to this side of the humerus. But in birds, they take the insertion point for one of those pectoralis muscles and loop it over pulley and attach it on the top of the humerus. So when one pectoralis muscle contracts, it brings it down. When the other muscle contracts, it brings it up. And both muscles are on the chest. Why? Why not just have a nice, big, beefy, trapezius, latissimus, dorsi muscle on the back to bring it all up like that? Why do that complicated little pulley system with the pectoralis muscles to bring it up? Anybody here have a pilot's license? Anybody here ever flown in a small plane, a cheap small plane? Anybody have an interest in learning to fly? Imagine you're going to say you're going to get your job at Burger King save half of every paycheck, put it away for an airplane, so that when you graduate, you can buy yourself a little airplane. What kind of an airplane can you buy? You don't have a lot of money, so it's going to be some cheap thing. What will it be? A bush plane? Yeah, yeah, okay, a bush plane. What are bush planes? It's going to be a cloth-bodied plane. It'll have stall tips. Where's the cabin relative to the wing? Below the wing or on top of the wing? Below. Below. So it's going to be a Piper Cruiser Cub. The cabin is suspended below the wing. So the center of mass is below the wing. How do hang gliders work? Wing, center of mass, below it. 
because that's stable and easy to control. Putting the center of mass above the wing is harder to control. So by having all the mass below the wing, you have a system that's easier to control. Now, this is the first time the reptiles have taken the air. There's this whole group of repti reptiles called the pterosaurs, and they were all capable of some level of flight. And some of these animals were absolutely huge. This is the fourth digit right there. So the wing is supported by the pinky finger. <clears throat> Look how big those wings are. There's a bit of a sternum right there. There's a bit of a sternum. You can imagine that these guys had some muscle mass there to be able to bring those wings down. When these things were first described, people assumed that pterosaurs were restricted to cliffs overlooking oceans. That makes sense. If you have a mouth that looks like that, it looks like it's going to be a filter feeder flying, scooping its head down into the water like a whale filtering out all the water and coming out with a mouthful of krill or something like that. Okay? But think about what that means. How easy is it going to be to fly with a body that shapes something like that? Some of these wings were as long as this room. These were monstrous animals. Some of these animals, if they were standing with their wings folded, would have been as tall as giraffes. And yet they were capable of flight. How do you do it with a mouth that looks like that? Let's imagine you have a mouth that looks like that, and you dip it into the water. What's going to happen? It's unlikely you're going to be able to take off from the water. In other words, we really don't understand the functional morphology of this at all. We know it's there, but we don't understand it. All right, if we look at the other sort of dinosaurs, so these are all the Ornithischian guys, the big, there are some cool guys here, the Ankylosaurs, the guys with all these plates, and all the um, Ceratopsian dinosaurs, and the Stegosaurs, and all of that kind of stuff. All this sort of, on the one hand, you think it's all ornamentation, but it's not necessarily so. It turns out that those plates had thermoregulatory consequences. A lot of what you're seeing on these guys is all about temperature regulation rather than anything else. This sort of stuff right here might very well be anti-predator stuff. This sort of stuff is probably all display. But the fact of the matter is that we really don't understand. We don't have any context with which to really understand these animals. And compare that with, well, Iguanodon, one of the very first dinosaurs to be fully articulated. This was at the British Museum. There was this huge unveiling of the first Iguanodon specimen from the British Isles. And when they found these things, they found the, these things on the, these, these cones, right? These bony cones. And when they put these things together, they didn't realize that it belonged on the hand. Instead, they put them on top of the head, like a rhinoceros or something like that. The first articulations of Iguanodon were a total mess. And of course, they automatically assumed that these animals were quadrupeds rather than bipeds. We really didn't understand anything about the morphology of these guys until very much later. And then, of course, you get things like Thionicus, which, if you listen to Ostrom, were the hot-blooded dinosaurs. Uh, Robert Backer was um, Ostrom's student, and he's the guy that wrote the book, The Dinosaur Heresies, and uh, the hot-blooded dinosaurs, and all of that sort of stuff. But they're building the argument that the dinosaurs were endothermic and had high body temperatures. Almost certainly, they had high body temperatures, but not because of endothermy more likely because of thermal inertia. So were these guys highly active? Unlikely. 
why did they require these guys to be highly active? So that they could build the argument that these guys evolved the ability to fly. And then, of course, you have the giants. Now, one interesting thing, um, uh, we don't have the specimen uh, indicated here, but uh, remember we were talking about Cope and Marsh. One interesting thing about all of that, um, I don't know if I, we got into that story, um, but, um, and I'll end with this, the controversy between Edward Drinker Cope and O.C. Marsh began with the mistake that Edward Drinker Cope made when he was when he articulated a skeleton. It was a skeleton for a giant reptile, and nobody at, it was a it was an aquatic reptile, and nobody at that point had any idea of why these things had long necks or long tails. When he articulated the thing, this was an animal that had, in Cope's view, a very short neck and a long tail, which made sense. So he put the skull at the end where it made sense, but he got it wrong. Because essentially what he did, he put the skull at the end of the tail, which was relatively short. And Marsh saw that and recognized the error. And then for the rest of their professional careers, that was this bone of contention between these two people where Cope ridiculed Marsh, for, or Marsh ridiculed Cope for having made that error. Interestingly enough, in the Badlands, when, when um, Marsh was out there collecting, he got a, a, an example of um, uh, Brachiosaurus. And he, it was a complete, almost a perfectly complete skeleton, but he, didn't have a, he couldn't find the skull. He kept looking, and some distance away, he found this skull. And he said, oh, well, here's the skull. So he used this skull for his Brachiosaurus and said, there it is. There's what Brachiosaurus looks like. And it wasn't until almost 100 years later that somebody's going, wait a minute. That's screwed up. That's a hot mess. That's not right. Turns out it was not the right skeleton. It was not, right the, sco the, not the right skull for that skeleton. So Marsh made a similar mistake. When they ultimately found the correct skull for that, for a specimen of that species, it was totally different. So that was one of those mistakes that Marsh made. And that's what resulted in, nobody calls it Brachiosaurus now, I think now it's referred to as Apatosaurus, okay? So the whole taxonomy has changed as a result of that one particular mistake. Question? Uh, well, I just want to point out that I know cycle that you showed the dinosaur writing on the ground. Run that by me again. Yeah, I know it's these illustrations show the dinosaurs and the bragging the tail from the ground. Yeah. Like in the classical sense, but, you know, they raise them up for balance because they're yeah. dinosaurs. So, well, they had such long necks or they had such big heads that they required to count the You know, I mean, the, the head is tiny for a, for a body that size, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that just, yeah. it's, it's, it's a cool system to think about. All right, uh, I still want to talk about evolution of birds. Um, perhaps we'll spend a little time on Thursday doing that. Okay, I want to get through that material. And uh, we have some lot of stuff to get done as well. So I will see you guys on Thursday.